Chapter Twenty Two. He knelt down gently and lowered the kid. He was just where you said he was, Sammy, and boy, what a great little jockey! He beamed at the kid. If you had a real horsey, you'd win at the Derby. From under the lamplight, the kitty cat blinked and said, "Horsey, horsey," and giggled and yawned. Bridget had pounced on him, licking his face. "Why, the baby is freezing!" she hollered at Buster. "Why, what were you thinking of, dragging him out? Oh, my sweet little fluffer!" she cooed. "Are you cold?" She attempted to warm him by pulling him closer. The kitten giggled again and said, "Mom," and then snuggled right into her. Sue going, "Ooh." With that goofy expression that ladies adopt in the presence of kids, Spike looked impatient and groaned in his throat. Slasher was squinting, Wilmer was bored, and Jean Claude was appraising the kitten like art. Monsieur will observe," he said after a second, "the family resemblance in whiskers and claws and the quite unmistakable pendant nose." I would know the child anywhere. This is my Louis, and now I shall claim him and bid you good night. Hold your horse and your kitten there, Frenchy. Slasher was carefully rising to terrible heights. He looked over everyone, casting a shadow that fell on the kitten. I'm taking the kid. Gotta have him so as Jimmy holds on to his store. Wilmer looked at him slyly. So figure me in. I could worm my way back into Gutless's mansion. Account I helped you deliver the kid. They leapt for the kitten. I leapt for the gun. It was Jean Claude's pistol, the one that I'd hid, with its ink supply dribbling and ready to shoot. I aimed at the desktop and said, "Hold it there." Everyone froze and then sucked in their breaths. I felt pretty stupid there, aiming that pistol. I wouldn't have shot it. I would know how, but it seemed to discourage immediate plans. Now back away from him, nice and slow. They backed away from him, nice and slow. Buster, who'd risen to cover the kid, gave a nod of approval. Spike looked relieved. Now let's just relax. I looked up at Jean Claude, and let's talk about lobster. Sue made a gasp. Jean Claude looked embarrassed. I know I promised you five pounds of lobster, Monsieur, but, alas, I am presently fishless. The most I could raise would be two cans of tuna. That wasn't the deal. Nonetheless, go and raise them. I said, "Go on. I won't give the kitten to anyone else. At least not while you're absent." He shot me a look of mistrust and suspicion, but left for the door. I turned back to Sue, who was busily glowering. They died the kitten. I said, "Tell me how. You're the expert groomer. I'm expert enough." To That I'd never die one," she said. "He'd die. A cat licks his fur, and he'd start to get poisoned. I guess the trick would be natural dye, and the only black dye I ever heard of is made out of caviar, olives, and squid. And how long would it last, in your expert opinion? A couple of weeks," she said. "Maybe a month." But of course, if you washed him, the color would fade. So then, why don't you wash him and see what you get? Bridget said, "Water? You'd wash him with water?" She cuddled the kitten who'd fallen asleep, but she held him protectively. Sue made a face. The water won't kill him. Honestly, Bridget, we'll do it together with nice warm. Please, just don't. Say the word again. Bridget looked frantic and highly unhappy and covered her ears. 
Spike whispered softly, I do what he says. Like, we need to be certain, he said, that it's Louis and not some imposter. You see what I mean? Sue got excited. Because if he isn't, then Bridget could keep him. Is that how it goes? I said, anything's possible, isn't it? Oh, Bridget looked at me hopefully. Out with you, ladies. Get on to Caboodle and into that sink. I waited as Bridget, still half-reluctantly, lifted the kid by the nape of his neck and then carried him tenderly out through the store, with Sue tailing after her. Slasher looked mad. If this is a stall, he said, swallowing hardware. You want to bring Jimmy the wrong little kid? It'll make gutless matter. Wilmer was giggling. You can't make him matter. He's already nuts. Then why, Buster said, would you want to go back there? Well, I wouldn't. Except for the food. Like, the food there is excellent. Yeah, but I bet he doesn't have roaches and fat little mice. Gee, you got roaches? Wilmer looked up, like he might reconsider as Spike scratched his jaw. Would you kindly continue, he said to me. Please? I mean, finish the story. So what happened then? I said, where was I? It's Saturday night, Spike prompted helpfully. Hench shot Sebastian and left with the kid. And went off to the Pearl, Buster added. And ordered a bottle of Hennessy, Wilmer threw in. And got up to his bedroom and called Mr. Gutless. He said, I've got him. I grinned at the group. And they made an appointment. Or so I'd imagine. I guess for Sunday to transfer the kid. And then he hangs up and gets totally wasted. But here's what's important. He misses the news. I paced on the desk, which was now less crowded, with half of us missing. The ten o'clock news that goes on about Louis and Louis's reward. Buster said, Listen, he couldn't have watched it. He'd wanted to watch it. The set doesn't work. Only Gutless watched it. Ten o'clock comes and he's watching the newscast in total surprise. He's already got it that Hench has the kitten, but now he gets worried. Supposing that Hench gets a load of the bounty, the 50000 and turns in the kitten or raises the price. So he tries to get cutesy and hires Jimmy. I turn to Slasher. He goes to the store. You said he arrived about... 10 to 11? Slasher just nodded and watched me with awe. And he tries to buy Jimmy for 200 bucks and a hard luck story. And Jimmy goes out and gets hit by some lumber and Louie escapes. Only somebody rescues him, Buster said quickly. A good looking guy with a streak on his head. He looked up at me, grinning. And Sam got it right. He was just where you said he was, Sammy. Happy and safe and asleep on a corduroy couch. Will you please just give me the answer? Spike was as ticked as I'd ever seen him. You're driving me nuts. Roll it back for a second to Saturday night. Mr. John O'Shaughnessy comes through his door with a bundle of groceries, and what does he find? That there isn't a kitten. Spike made a shrug. And there isn't a Bridget, I said. She's gone. She'd gone to the gallery. I'd have to imagine she looked at the phone book and found the address. Really rub that in. Spike was deeply embarrassed, but trying to hide it by shooting me looks. So he went out to hunt for them. That's what he did, taking Bridget's carrier, roaming the streets until well after midnight. That's when he stumbled on poor little Louie and took the kid home. Or so I'd imagine. But how did you know? I mean, 
how did you know he's the guy with a streak? There was something that bothered me, Spike, from the start. I looked over at Slasher and said, It was you. You were watching O'Shaughnessy's Saturday night. You were there when I got there. Why were you there? Because... No, don't tell me, I said. Let me guess it. You'd followed Jimmy. You'd wanted to help him or maybe protect him. You left for the Pearl, and you followed right after him. Saw the whole thing. Saw him hit by the lumber, and then saw O'Shaughnessy taking the kitten, and followed him home. Slasher said, Pally, you got my respect. And there's one other factor, I added, and opened the copy of Moonshot I left on the desk. O'Shaughnessy's picture was slapped on the flap. He was handsome, all right, and his jet-black hair had a big streak of white in it, right at the top. So, you're not such a genius, then. Wilmer looked smug. I wouldn't be so sure of that, Buster threw in as the traveling Frenchman showed up with the cans. <laughs>